More than six dozen rabbis walk into a hotel and shave their heads. This is not the start of an inappropriate ethnic joke. This is a true story of what happened when a group of faith leaders decided they didn't want to bury any more kids whose lives could have been saved. It's a lesson that a seemingly innocuous comment can be the start of something amazing. And it's a reminder that a group of ordinary people can do something extraordinary. Last October, my dear friend Rabbi Phyllis Summer casually wondered if it was time for her to participate in a St. Baldrick's Shave event. She had first learned about the St. Baldrick's Foundation not long after her son Sammy was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia in June 2012. And like many parents of kids with cancer, she wanted to do something to help support their work. I wondered aloud if we could convince some of our rabbinic colleagues to join her and shave too. And that's when we hatched a plot. What if 36 reform rabbis shaved their heads to bring attention to the fact that only 4% of US federal funding for cancer research is earmarked for all pediatric cancers? And what if we raised a ton of money along the way? In 1999, three businessmen came up with a unique proposal. They would raise money for childhood cancer research by pledging to shave their heads. Since that time, the St. Baldrick's Foundation has raised more than $150 million in research grants, all for pediatric cancer. Now, it might seem strange that a group of rabbis was joining forces with what appears to be a Catholic organization. But guess what? There is no St. Baldrick. St. Baldrick is a mashup of two words, bald and St. Patrick, because the first event took place on St. Patrick's Day, March 17, 2000. We all know that hair loss is a common side effect of cancer treatment, but what you may not realize is that hair loss for a kid is especially traumatic. So head shaving is done as a sign of solidarity. And it's a gimmick, a really effective one. If we learned anything this past summer, it's this. People are willing to do crazy things for a cause, even, apparently, when ice water is involved. So there's another thing that we learned. A culture of giving can be cultivated. That one video went viral this summer and sparked a giving revolution. Donations to nonprofit organizations are up 50%, and that is a significant increase. And about the number 36. So in the Hebrew alphabet, every letter has a numeric equivalent. Take the number 18. It's the numeric equivalent of the Hebrew word for life. Double 18 is 36. So 36 is double life. But in our conversation, Phyllis and I were especially taken with an additional significance of the number 36. Jewish tradition teaches that at any given time, there are 36 righteous individuals in the world. And if just one of them is missing, the world itself would cease to exist. These 36 righteous individuals are known as the Lamed Vavniks, based on the numeric equivalent of the two Hebrew letters that form 36, Lamed, which is 30, and Vav, which is 6. The identities of these 36 righteous individuals are hidden from one another and even from themselves. In fact, if someone were to come along and claim to be one of the 36 righteous, that would be enough proof to know he or she is most certainly not a Lamed Vavnik. But what if for just one moment, everyone behaved as if he or she truly was that righteous. Imagine that world. 
And then we wondered, what if we gave our colleagues the opportunity to do something unbelievably righteous? Because at the end of the day, we were asking them to shave their heads, not cut their hair or dump a bucket of ice water on themselves. We were asking them to submit to the clippers in public and go bald for a cause. We were asking them to temporarily disfigure themselves. Now, for some of my more follically challenged colleagues, this was not that much of a sacrifice, I admit. Not so for those whose thick and luxurious locks were now destined for the floor of the grand ballroom. And yes, before you even ask, 17% of our shavies were women. And that is a tremendous commitment in a society such as ours, which places such high value on outward appearances. And so the 36 rabbis shave for the brave was born. Now all we had to do was find the place and when to do it. And that's when it seemed as though the stars had aligned. The Central Conference of American Rabbis, the largest rabbinic organization in North America, had scheduled its annual convention to be held in Chicago, just five months after we had this idea. Phyllis and her family live in the greater Chicago area, and we envisioned a celebration with Sammy at its center and his family there in attendance. Just two weeks after this conversation, however, Phyllis and her husband, Rabbi Michael Summer, learned that Sammy had relapsed. His bone marrow transplant had failed, and they had to tell their eight-year-old son that there was nothing more that could be done for him. They had to tell him that there was no more hope. I don't want to die. What will you do without me? Will you have a baby to replace me? You're going to put me in a box and put me in the ground, and I'll never get to do all the things I wanted to do. I wanted to do something amazing. Four weeks later, in the wee hours of December 14th, 2013, Surrounded by his beloved parents, Samuel Asher Summer breathed his last breath, and two days later on a frigid, snowy day, was tenderly laid to rest by his grief-stricken family and friends. But Sammy's wish to do something amazing had already been set into motion. Now, the folks at the St. Baldrick's Foundation were completely unprepared to deal with a bunch of crazy rabbis. The special events coordinator asked if we had given any thought to a fundraising goal, which of course we had. $180,000, that's our goal. $18,000, she asked. No, $180,000, I said dead silence on the other end of the line. You see, I continued, if we get 36 rabbis to sign on, they only have to raise $5,000 each. To which she said, we don't often hear $5,000 and only in the same sentence. And with that, we were off and running. In the early 1980s, you may remember that Fabergé Organic Shampoo had this commercial where the spokesmodel, shaking her gorgeous mane of hair, said that the shampoo was so incredible that she told two friends, and they told two friends, and so on, and so on, and so on. This was the approach of the 36 rabbis. Before our fundraising page went live, we contacted a small core group of rabbi friends who we believed were likely to join our cause. It's like lining up your key major donors before you start a campaign. We knew that we needed a critical mass in order to gain momentum, and it didn't take us very long to get our 36 rabbis. And before we knew it, more than 70 rabbis 
from across different Jewish denominations and from across North America had registered to shave. This small idea was growing into something huge. Major media outlets carried our story because we, naively, believed that it was a story worth telling, and so we kept on telling it. That naivete made us fearless and unstoppable. With participants spread out across the United States and Canada, we got attention both local and national. From the Morning Call and the Washington Post, to major network affiliates in New York City and Chicago, to online sites such as the todayshow.com and Yahoo, we were everywhere. Our 75 rabbis told their stories to everyone with whom they came into contact, in real life and online. With extensive social networks, we knew that they could leverage those relationships to extend their reach far and wide. Nearly all the money we have raised has been through social media. We met our initial goal of $180,000 within a few weeks after we launched. So we raised it, and we raised it again, and we raised it again, and we are now on track to pass the $1 million mark by the end of the year. Not from corporations or from a few large gifts, but from thousands upon thousands of small donations from around the world. Because one person told two friends, and they told two friends, and you get the idea. I see you. I see you looking at my hair. You're looking at my hair, and you're asking yourself, did she? Didn't she? So let me put you out of your misery and just tell you, I didn't. I did not shave my head. I thought about it. I really did. I was so busy in the weeks and the days leading up to the shave, from fielding media requests to making certain we had enough plastic sheeting to protect the floor of that grand ballroom. I was so busy putting everything together that I realized I couldn't run an event and shave at it and deal with the emotional impact all at the same time. See, we rabbis, by our very nature, take the ordinary and make it extraordinary. Or as we like to say, we take the mundane and we make it sacred. And that evening was sacred. It was incredible. Despite the sadness that Sammy wasn't there, it still felt like a celebration. There was laughter, lots and lots of laughter, though now I realize some of it may have been nervous laughter, and a lot of rubbing of newly shorn scalps. And when the clippers finally lay silent, amid hugs and laughter and some tears, we thanked God for giving us life and for bringing us to that moment and for allowing us and giving us the strength to do good in our world. I woke up the next morning and I thought to myself, oh my God, I'm 43 years old and I think I may have just done the most important thing I will ever do in my entire life. Now what? But the work wasn't done. We had given a button to each of our shavees that said, ask me why I'm bald. Since most of our shavees had traveled to Chicago from out of town, we figured that these pins would give our newly bald friends organic opportunities to engage strangers with whom they met as they were traveling home, the opportunity to have conversations about the need for increased funding for pediatric cancer research. One of my favorite stories involves a colleague who was concerned that his new hairdo didn't match the picture in his government-issued ID. He made it through the detector at the airport fine. It was when he bent down to put on his shoes 
that the TSA agent said, I wouldn't do that. Do what? He nervously asked. Your bag, she said, has a button on it. Says, ask me why I'm balding. I would never do that. <laughs> Actually, he chuckled, it says, ask me why I'm bald. He then proceeded to tell the TSA agent about a little boy named Sammy and about a bunch of crazy rabbis and about what we had done to honor his wish. And by the time my colleague was done, the TSA agent had tears running out of her eyes. And after a moment, she said, thank you. Thank you for sharing your experience with me. I feel like Sammy is now part of my life too. What can I do to help? This is just one of dozens and dozens of stories. And in each of these rabbis' communities, people's lives have been touched. Congregations held viewing parties to watch footage of their rabbi going bald. Hebrew school students have donated their allowances to the St. Baldrick's Foundation. Kids and adults alike have been inspired to shave their own heads. And one very entrepreneurial synagogue auctioned off ad space on their rabbi's bald head. <laughs> that poor guy had to wear an I Love the Red Sox tattoo for two weeks. And he's a diehard Yankees fan. <laughs> More than six dozen rabbis walked into a hotel and shaved their heads, and it was no joke. This story could be your story, too. Because it's the story of what happens when a group of ordinary people yearn to do something and reach deep into their, into their social networks to make the extraordinary happen. Thank you.